Okay, perfect. All right. So it is now 511. I believe we are ready to get started. And I do thank everyone for coming out tonight. We are going to be hearing Laura Tohi read from the late Dr. Evangeline Parsons Yazi, um, her children's book, Zana Yeja Nazba, Little Woman Warrior Who Came Home, a story about the Navajo Long Walk. And um, thank you, Laura, for joining us tonight and offering to read this wonderful book. Now, I do want to start off with saying a few words about Dr. Evangeline Parsons Yazi, who unfortunately passed away. Um, she was such a great writer, a great friend, a great person to work with, a uh, huge inspiration in her community. Um, so I do want to speak uh, a few words about her, her work, and her book, and then go ahead and introduce Laura Tohi, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. So once again, thank you for joining us. We are gathered here today to hear Navajo poet and writer Laura Tohi read from the late Dr. Evangeline Parsons Yazi's children's book, Zana Yeja Nazba, Little Woman Warrior Who Came Home. Now, as an author, Yazi is most esteemed for writing books in Navajo language for children and youth, including Dine Baza Banaho'a, Little Woman Warrior Who Came Home, a story of the Navajo Long Walk, and the historical novel series titled Her Land, Your Love. Now, as well as developing a Navajo language textbook and work book titled Dine Baza Banaho'a, Rediscovering the Navajo Language, the textbook was used in schools and colleges to teach the Navajo language as well as the history of her Navajo people. Dr. Yazi also taught Navajo at Northern Arizona University for 24 years after obtaining her Master of Arts degree in bilingual multicultural education and a doctorate in education emphasizing native language maintenance and preservation. Yazi was Tohedlini, Water Flows Together clan, born for Maedeshkishni, Coyote Pass and Jemez clan. And she was originally from Hard Rock, Arizona. Now, her passing was felt largely in her Navajo community, amongst her friends, and amongst her family. Her contribution to her Navajo people and to her writing was immense and will remain immense in the memory she's imprinted on us all, and especially through her very important work. I remember the last project we worked on was a workbook and a teacher's textbook to help teach the Herlandry Love novel series. It was at the very start of the pandemic, so all of us were kind of stuck in our own rooms and we were working through Zoom for sometimes five hours a day for a whole month and a half. And the stories that we shared together and just the wisdom that she shared with me over our sessions, our editing sessions, going over line by line. Um, I learned a lot from her as a writer. I learned a lot from her as an editor. She taught me what it takes to make a really good book that benefits her Navajo people, that benefits storytelling, Navajo storytelling, Navajo history, and Navajo language preservation. She was such a smart person. Her experience in the field of education was second to none. Her passion for it was definitely second to none as well. And I just wanted to hold a reading series and gather us here today to go ahead and celebrate her hard work. Um, so this particular book, Zana Yeja Nazba, Little Woman Warrior Who Came Home, was published quite a few years ago and ended up um, attaining quite a few awards over the years. And it was out of print for some time. And unfortunately, it was only able to be reprinted. Um, you can go ahead and buy it at solanabookshelf.com. But it was unfortunately only reprinted uh, very shortly after her passing. And so we wanted to have a way to celebrate this a very important book. Um, just the story of the long walk itself is one that's very important to the Navajo people, one that's important to teach anyone and everyone um, about a, a very important time for the Navajo people. So, so thank you for joining us here today to celebrate this work. And a big, big thank you to Laura Tohi for offering to read us through this and have a brief discussion about Dr. Evangeline Parsons and her work. So I would love to introduce Laura Tohi now. Laura Tohi is the Nah, And she was born in Crystal, or she grew up in Crystal, New Mexico, near the Cheska Mountains on the Diné homeland. Her published books include Making Friends with Water, a poetry chapbook, No Parole Today, 
a book on boarding schools, Sister Nations, Native American Women Writers on Community, co-edited with Heidi Erdrich. She's also the author of Say It Deep in the Rock, a poetry co collaboration with photographer Stephen Strong, and as well as the author of Co-Talkers, an oral history book in which she interviewed and wrote with several remaining Navajo Co-Talkers. The Phoenix Symphony commissioned her to write the libretto for Enemy Slayer, a Navajo oratorio, which made its 2008 world premiere as part of the Phoenix Symphony's 60th anniversary. A poet, a writer, a librettist, Tohi's work has been published in such journals as Plowshares, New Letters, Cream City Review, Red Ink, World Literature Today, and many others. Her work has appeared in the US, Canada, South America, and Europe, as well as being published in French, Dutch, and Italian translations. She has read her poetry internationally in the US, Europe, and South America. Laura holds a doctorate degree in creative writing, indigenous American literature, and American literature. And in 2015, Laura was honored as the Navajo Nation Poet Laureate for 20, from 2015 to 2017, a title given to her in celebration and recognition of her work as a poet and a writer. And Laura Tohi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I know you you were such a, a big help and a big inspiration for Dr. Evangeline Parsons Yazzi as well. Um, she used to talk to me about the bond that you both created. Um, as she was pursuing her writing journey, writing about the long walk and interviewing lots of people and the way that she retold these people's stories, um, she always reminded me of how much of a huge inspiration that you were in her writing as a friend and as a support system as well. And so it's, it's such an honor to introduce you today and it's such an honor to have you here to share one of your great friends and one of your great co-writers work. So thanks again. Ahiehe Tyler and to the Salina Bookshelf for holding this uh, online reading series. I'm very honored to be here and to read my dear friend's book. I hope I don't get emotional <laughs> because today as I was reading this book again, um, I could see the love and the passion she has for stories and for language and for uh, wanting to keep those alive. And also um, because she was a person that cared so much um, that she wrote many texts, novels, and a language book so that the language could live on and be preserved for the future generations. I wanna first of all, just talk about a little bit about my relationship with um, Evangeline or Vanji, as I called her, I was, um, I came to Flagstaff, Arizona in 1993 to be interviewed for the position of assistant professor at the um, NAU, Northern Arizona University. And she came to my dinner and my interview. And then afterwards, um, we had a conversation and I was immediately drawn to her because she had such a lovely personality. She was kind and I could see she was a wise person and also very intelligent. So I was very happy to make her acquaintance. And after our first meeting, we started to um, get together as friends. We talk on the phone for many hours and she would come down to Phoenix and we would have dinners and um, and I would go up to uh, Flagstaff and do the same. Um, she was, I called her Shadeja, my younger sister. Um, and she also was someone who was very inspirational to me as a writer and as a Diné person. Um, she uh, invited me to her home in Hard Rock, Arizona, uh, the first year I was living here in Phoenix. And we went there to, um, at a time when there was lambing season and we went to her aunt's house and we visited her for a while. We saw the lambs 
and then we drove back to Flagstaff. Um, I knew her for almost 30 years and I'm still trying to get used to the idea of her being gone um, because she was uh, a person that I deeply cared about. Um, in the Navajo, we call from someone passing, we, we call them, yeah, so meaning that this person um, has moved on into the next world or the next um, life. Um, <clears throat> so as I was saying this morning, I was rereading this book, Little Woman Warrior, and it was such an emotional experience for me because I could see Vanjie in all the words and the stories that she was writing about. In this book, she writes in a way to tell a story that is a very dark story in American history, but also in Navajo history. And it's so beautifully done um, where it it's, tells a story and it tells a story about a family who have to rely on each other and who love each other. And it's through this connection, the sense of uh, relationships that the family is can survive and keep together during this period when the Navajo people were destined to be erased. And, and it's such a beautiful story about this family and how they cling to each other and how they help out each other. It's the same themes that are in her novels that she wrote. So I'm going to um, start the reading the book, but I want to also dedicate this reading to Vanjie's family. Um, two of her children passed on, uh, Alan, her, her son uh, was the oldest son passed on. And sadly, her oldest daughter passed a few days after uh, Vanjie did. But her family are her son, Alan Parsons, her daughter, Naomi Parsons Cannonberg, and her grandchildren, Isaac and April Cannonbert. Zanabat Yaja Nazba, Little Woman Warrior Who Came Home. Written and translated by Evangeline Parsons Yazi, EDD, and illustrated by Irving Toddy, Navajo artist. In 1856, a girl given the name Zanayaja Nazba was born at the base of Black Mesa. Her father named her little woman warrior who came home because he knew that Navajo, Navajo had many enemies. Her family called her Zanabat for short because her name was sacred. Zanabat's family lived on land that was surrounded by four sacred mountains. Far to the east were the great La Plata Mountains, far to the south, was beautiful Mount Taylor. Nearer to their home in the west were the majestic San Francisco peaks, and far in the north sat great Mount Hesperus. As Zanabat grew older, the mountains kept watch over her and her family. Zanabat's mother was a quiet but strong woman, and her father was a war leader. Zanabat had two older brothers and no sisters. Many relatives lived nearby, so she was never alone. And these are the illustrations that um, Irving Toddy did. And this is at the beginning of the story. Uh, and here is her family uh, in this illustration and surrounding the uh, the people in this are the four sacred mountains that she mentions. So the story begins um, with the arrival of the soldiers and they are kidnapping um, children, girls, women. 
some of the uh, illustrations um, don't are a little bit um, ahead of of the story, so we will keep up as quickly as best as I can with that. Zandabas' happy childhood ended suddenly when some U.S. troops came to her family's hogan. Zandabat was all alone with the little lambs and goats. Her father had gone to meet with other war leaders and mother, and her mother had left to gather juniper berries. Zanabat was afraid of the troops. She tried to hide, but she became so frightened that she ran towards the juniper trees in search of her mother. A soldier saw her and grabbed her, pulling, putting his hand over her mouth. Zanabat tried to squirm and kick and yell, but it was no use. The soldier tied her up and put her on a horse. Before they left her home area, the soldiers grabbed several little lambs and tied them up in the same way Zanabat was tied. As Zanabat traveled eastward with the soldiers, she saw the landscape change many times. Zanabat grew more sad and homesick with every change. She saw the sagebrush change to short shrubs, and then they came to an area that was covered with orange sand and many orange mesas. Soon the sagebrush returned and Zanaba saw many black rocks that formed tall mesas. As they neared Fort Canby, the, nasa, the mesas changed from black to white and the valley was covered with green vegetation. It was an area different from anything Zanaba had ever seen before. If she had not been a captive of these soldiers, Zanaba would have thought the valley was beautiful. As Zanaba traveled eastward with the soldiers, Oops, I got a little behind there. When they arrived at Fort Canby, Zanabat noticed many Navajo children huddled in little groups crying. The children had been kidnapped just as Zanabat had been and were being used as bait to capture their parents. It was not long before Zanabat's family was forced to walk to the fort. Zanabat was glad to see her family again but sad because she did not want to see them as captives. During their stay at Fort Canby, Zanaba and her family were given one small meal every day. They were very hungry. Zanaba remembered the way the air smelled when her mother cooked blue cornbread and wanted more than anything to eat some of that bread dipped in warm goat's milk. Before long, the soldiers announced that all the Navajo prisoners would be forced to walk to Fort Sumner in eastern New Mexico territory, which was nearly 450 miles from their homes. Why are we being forced to walk so far? asked Zanaba. My feet and my legs hurt. Mother took Zanaba's hand and held it. When we find some herbs, we will rub your feet and legs with them to make you feel better. Now, sing one of the songs we have taught you. It will help the ground move faster under your feet. The journey to Fort Sumner was difficult for all the Navajo. Zanaba saw old people, children, and pregnant women walking, putting one foot in front of the other, not knowing where they were being forced to go. Children and some older people cried as they walked. The children cried because they were frightened, and the old ones cried 
because they did not want to leave their land between the sacred mountains. Zanabat watched as the old Navajo became sick and fell to the back of the line. The soldiers took the feeble behind a hill and shot them. No proper burial was allowed for those who died. The soldiers pushed away the mourning relatives, forcing them to continue walking. As Zanaba and her people walked further and further from their homeland, their beloved sacred land faded from view. When Mount Taylor, her sacred mountain of the south vanished behind her. Zanabat vowed that she would never forget the prayers and songs she had learned through the years. She promised herself that she would raise her children back home on beautiful Black Mesa. After they had walked many days, Zanaba and her family were hungry, tired, and homesick. Their bodies and minds ached. They were almost too tired to walk over a low rise. When they reached it, they saw Fort Sumner spread out below them. Zanaba began to cry. Her tears made many marks on her slender, sunburned face. As prisoners of war, the Navajo tried four springs to plant crops. The land was not kind. The ground was hard. Although the Pecos River ran through the fort, the water was too alkaline and the crops were choked to death. When the crops did grow a little one year, the worms came and destroyed the tender plants. There were also times when it rained so hard that the crops were washed away. When Zanabat saw her father prepare for planting the third year, she said, Father, our crops will be destroyed again. Why can't we wait until we get back to Black Mesa before we plant? I know the crops will be destroyed, answered father quietly. But we plant because we cannot let our children and grandchildren forget our ways. Our children learn many things about the environment through the planting of corn. Because the crops failed, Zanabat's family and the other Navajo had to rely on the troops to provide them with rations. The food given to them was strange to their bodies. Her mother was given dark beans, which she boiled in the bitter river water. No matter how long they boiled the beans, they did not get any softer. Zanabat's mother would throw out the water and then the family would eat the beans. Later, they were to learn the bean was coffee. The other food was no better. The flour was pink and had many dead bugs in it, and the meat the soldiers called bacon was rotten and smelled horrible. Zanabat's mother cooked the bacon anyway because it was the only food they had. There was a time when Zanabat's brother ate the bacon and nearly died. One day, Zanabat saw some girls and women picking through the corn and oats that was put out for the soldiers' horses. 
Zanaba snuck over to the corral, grabbed two handfuls of corn and stuffed them into the sides of her tattered moccasins. A soldier saw her. To punish her, he and some other soldiers took her to a dirty pond and smeared mud all over her face. They laughed as she ran away and spat the mud out of her mouth. It was a humiliating experience, but that evening, as her family ate the corn that was mixed with oats, Zanabat vowed that she would be brave enough to provide her family with decent food again. While the Nabaho were prisoners at Fort Sumner, Zanaba reached puberty. Her mother cried soft, bitter tears as she told Zanaba that the Nabaho were not to hold the Kinalda puberty ceremony outside of their sacred land. We can celebrate your Kinalda when your time comes again, said mother. I hope we will not be prisoners then. Nabaho always celebrate the first and second one. I will tell my body to wait until we get home, said Zanaba. We will have it there. Zanaba and all of her people could have perished at Fort Sumner, but the children, the clan system, their songs and their prayers helped them survive extremely desperate times. It was the clan system that brought together Navajo who were once strangers to one another. Zanaba found many people who were related to her by clan and she, her family and their new relatives began to provide for one another. Together, they gave one another encouragement, courage, and kind words. After four long years, the Navajo heard that an important soldier named Sherman was coming to inspect conditions at Fort Sumner. Barbancito, a good friend and brother to Zanabat's father by clan, was selected by the Navajo to speak for them. Zanabat watched and listened as her father and other leaders discussed with Barbancito what they wanted him to tell Sherman. When the men were through talking, Barbancito stood up and looked gently into the eyes of the children. Zanabat felt warm when her eyes met his. Barbancito persuaded Sherman to let the Navajo return to the land between the sacred mountains. The Treaty of 1868 was set aside. The Treaty of 18 set, 1868 set aside their land and released them from imprisonment on June 1st, 1868. Zanaba followed her mother to a rocky hill near their old home. She watched as her mother removed large rocks piled against the side of the hill. As more rocks were removed, Zanaba could see faded gray designs on a rug that was hidden in a large hole. With great effort, her mother pulled the bundle out and opened it to reveal a wedding basket a small bag of rock salt, some jewelry made of shells and precious stones, and several ears of dried blue corn. Tearfully, Zandabat's mother held these items 
up to the sunlight. We are ready to begin preparations for your Kinalda ceremony, she announced. Later that evening, Zanaba stood alone at the base of Black Mesa. She thought of everything she, her family, and all in Navajo had endured during the past few years. Zanaba lifted her head higher. She was proud that she was Navajo, proud that her people had survived Huelte. Their survival would give life to all future generations of the people. This is, I think, one of the themes of Vanjie's work. And she also wrote an author's note in which she explains what started her on this path to find the truth and this drove her to writing uh, the many things that she wrote. And I just think this is a beautiful way to end this story. Um, she did tell me that when she was a young girl, her grandmother told her to come and sit beside her so that she could tell her these stories. And Vanji said she sat by her grandmother and listened to all these stories that she kept inside of her for many, many years. And then at a point in time, Vanji was ready to write those stories and she remembered them and wrote these four novels and this children's book. And Tyler mentioned that she was also writing a workbook. But on top of that, she was also starting a book on boarding schools when she passed. But I want to read to you the author's note. She said, I vividly remember an episode that took place in an American history class during my senior year of high school. During a lecture about the long walk, the teacher announced that, quote, the Navajo people were removed to Bosco, Bosco Gay Redondo because they were raiders and stealers, end quote. While looking me in the eye, the only Navajo in the class, he continued by saying, and I am not talking about the NFL football teams. Everyone in the classroom laughed and stared at me. It was then that I began my search for the truth. It is a popular belief that the Navajo people were removed from their home and placed as prisoners of war at Fort Sumner because they were, quote, raiders and stealers, end quote. In actuality, there are many reasons not commonly cited for the removal of the Navajo people to Bosque Redondo. Following are a few reasons rarely discussed. And the things that she wrote about were, were also what was happening in the United States during the era of removal. And the Navajo people were among some of the tribes that were removed from their original homelands during this period. She cites five reasons for the removal. One being that in 1847, silver was found in the Nevada mountains and California when they became part of the United States. Two years later, gold was discovered and the gold rush began. Navajo warriors were attempting to protect what was theirs when they retaliated against the prospectors and settlers. And it was during this time when the settler colonizer wanted access through indigenous homeland so they could move west to the gold rush. In 1848, the second one, the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the war between the United States and Mexico. New Mexico territory, which included Arizona, 
was included in the land turned over to the United States. Military exhibitions were led into Navajo country to subdue the raiders and to take their land. The third reason, in 1858, the superintendent of Indian affairs began to carry out a plan for concentrating the Indians of the Southwest on reservations. The fourth reason, from 1861 to 1865, the Civil War was raging and the government needed ammunitions and supplies. It was believed that the area the Navajo occupied in Arizona and New Mexico had a great supply of gold, silver, minerals, and ore. Several years later, the Transcontinental Railroad entered the land of the Navajo. And I just want to mention that because it was believed that these resources were on uh, Navajo land, the, it was believed that they had to be removed and hence they were uh, forcibly marched to Fort Sumner where they barely survived and nearly starved from, from lack of food and water. And then the fifth reason, she said Indian slavery was rampant during the 1800s. Navajo women and children were sought after because they were known to be hard workers. The Navajo warriors retaliated. There are lots of stories of this happening where children and women and young boys were kidnapped and taken to Mexico and it's believed that some of the Navajo people are still down there and living, and uh, we don't know who they are. And this last note that she wrote, which I think is a message to all of us um, to think about why Vanji, Dr. Parsons Yazi, mother, grandmother, teacher, friend, uh, would write this for us so that we can think about what she said and apply this, and especially to the young people. She would believed that our future was in the hands of the young people, that they would learn the language so that they could pass that language on and that we would not lose that language. This is her last note. I wanted to present Navajo youth with a Navajo perspective on the long walk. Many more stories need to be tapped so that our youth will not be, shamed, will not be ashamed of their ancestors or forget the hardship their ancestors endured because they were Navajo. Navajo youth have a right to the truth of their history. They have a right to be proud to be Navajo. So thank you for your attendance and for coming to this event. And I believe there's a little bit of time for Q&A and discussion. If you have any, please feel free to um, write them. Can they write them in the chat board, Tyler, or should they just ask? Um, they have a, they'll, they're able to um, type them into the chat board. Um, okay. If you do have a question, I can um, allow anyone who raises their hand to talk. Um, you can go ahead and verbally say your question. Um, we invite anyone watching through Facebook as well to go ahead and ask a question. But um, thank you again, Laura, so much for just your participation, um, mm -hmm. being able to meet with us here tonight and to read such an important story. Um, again, um, it is a children's book. It's a children's story. It's a story written um, for a children, for a young reader. And so this perspective of storytelling is um, incredibly, incredibly important, not only to Navajo children, as you highlighted through the author's note, but for anyone else who wants to learn about this part in history. It's important to get the truth. It's important to get that um, perspective out. And to see such a narrow lens on Native American cultures for children's books, um, again, it's such a wonderful 
event to have this year today. So thanks again. Again, if anyone wants to ask a question, go ahead and type that into the chat. Um, we are currently not um, planning for another time for the reading to be told in Navajo. Um, maybe that could be something we do set up in Navajo if people are interested enough. Um, but thanks for your question. That is That could be something that we can, we can yeah. think about in the future. Well, <clears throat> I also just want to add that um, the themes of Evangeline's work was that she had a great love for her people, the Diné, and for the language that helped sustain Diné identity. And, and she had such a great respect for stories that were part of our history, our culture, and our identity. And I think she wanted to see our reflection in these books that she wrote. And she wanted to see these books in the library along with other, other history stories of other cultures and other people. She also had a great respect for the elders who were keepers of the stories because after all, it was her grandmother who told her these stories that she wrote. And I think she also had an enduring belief in preserving the stories and the Navajo language for the future generations of Diné. Sadly, we lost her too soon, and I'm sure she would have written much more. I always learned so much when I was just by her side, either where we were giving readings or we were selling books together at conferences. She always told me so much, especially about her journey writing this book. Um, I do believe that when she was trying to find a little bit more about the Navajo long walk, she wanted to get a Navajo perspective. So she did want to interview actual Navajo families who had their own stories to tell, either through their elders or their own familiar stories that, that were passed through generations. And it was such an incredible journey to hear her talk about the way that she she took the Navajo perspective and she shared the people that she interviewed, she shared their stories. Um, I'm sure it was such a hard thing to endure to hear these terrible and hard stories, but mm -hmm. you know, the work that she did, <clears throat> the work that she did ended up resulting in this children's book. It resulted in Her Land, Her Love, the novel series, and it also resulted in the Navajo language book. So her persistence, her passion to tell the truth, her passion as a teacher to teach the truth, um, in a way that's educated through a textbook, through a workbook, through a way that was interactive as well. I think it was such an amazing feat. So thank you again for, for sharing some more stories. I just want to share one last story about Vangeline and it's sort of a, a metaphor for who she was. Um, she came down to Phoenix one day. We went to the mall because one of the stores was having a big, sale on clothing and she was at the time a speaker for the Arizona Humanities and so we went over there to look at the sales and they sure had a big sale there and so she, we went through the racks and she picked out um, clothing to try on in the dressing room and I waited for her and she came out with a stack of clothes um, and she put it on the cash register table and the lady, the clerk added everything up and she had so many clothes that they couldn't put it in a shopping bag. So um, she got out, the clerk got out a big black bag that was about the size of a garbage bag, a big black one. And she put all of Vanjie's clothes in there. And sure enough, um, the clothes didn't cost that much. But anyway, so she put all these clothes in a big bag and she hauled it out and um, we were there late. And so um, they had closed part of the doors at the mall. So we had to go out a door that was farther away from the car. And uh, we walked out of the store and my Vanjie had her bag of clothes and she said, 
now I can go talking in these nice clothes. And he said, I can, uh, I don't have to change them. I can wear a different outfit every day to class too. So we started walking uh, out of the store and it was so heavy, she couldn't hold it, just, you know, lift it up in front of her. And so she flung that bag over her back, <laughs> like she was Santa Claus, <laughs> carrying out a big bag of toys. And um, I just started laughing and I said, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> and we just started laughing and we walked out into the parking lot and we had to walk quite a ways because the car was, was way out there. And I just remember that story. And I'd like to think of it as a metaphor for her because in that bag, not only were clothing, but in that bag, she carried all these wonderful stories that she wrote and um, that she is sharing with us and the legacy that she left for us. So I just still remember her with her big bag of stories. <laughs> right. Yeah, she was really funny. Um, there's a lot of stories that she would tell randomly and a lot of moments that we had together. She was really funny. She wasn't yeah. scared to be funny. She wasn't, she always asked me a lot of questions about myself, how I was doing. Um, how my family was doing and you know she was such a passionate person someone who cared a lot um and we do have a few questions um one from rachel vigor um my local librarians would happily purchase would happily purchase these books um how do i order this book so you can head over to our website at solanabookshelf.com um go ahead and look under products and we'll have a list of children's books and um, you'll be able to find Little Woman Warrior there as well. Um, another person was asking if they could have access to this recording. So this whole webinar was recorded. We'll be able to put it up on our YouTube. Go ahead and follow us at selenabookshop.com. And I'll go ahead and po post it in our blog site as well. So if you head to our website and maybe hopefully by the end of tomorrow or sometime early this week, we'll also have this webinar ready and archived on our website. Um, but I do have you email the person who was asking. Um, I'll go ahead and get she, you an email whenever that's ready to view so you can go ahead and share it with whoever you'd like to. Um, and then we do have another question. So Rachel Vigor asks, for people who are not Diné, what is a helpful thing to say to help learners feel welcomed to the stories and able to enjoy and tell of the Diné stories too? What do you think about that, Laura? Um, can I see the question? Yes. Is there a way for me to just click on Q&A? Yeah, so it's in the Q&A. Oh, okay. So Rachel Vigor, uh, near the bottom of the... Oh, I did, okay. For people who are not doing that, what is a helpful thing to say to help learners feel welcome to the stories and able to enjoy and tell them the stories too? Um, I think especially these difficult historical topics. Well, you know, stories, I think we are all, as humans, we are hardwired for stories. And we love stories. Um, that's why they're so popular, you know, even in mainstream media. Um, I think you, are, you have already express um, how you go about this and just saying, you know, welcome. I, I guess it would depend on the context or if this is a classroom, for example, if you're teaching these kinds of stories, I think it would be helpful for the children to have, or students to have a context for why, um, say for example, Evangeline's book is important and I think it would be important for the students to understand what the context is behind the long walk. Um, you know, and I think the students would be interested in that. Um, I think that's, if I were, it, I was a professor at ASU for many years and these stories that are now being written were not, um, written previously. So many um, native stories, many Navajo stories have not been written. Our stories are 
you know, part of the oral tradition. But now we have also written some of these stories. And I think that it's important now because our stories have been invisible for so many years that now uh, there is an interest in what we've been, in, in, for example, what Evangeline is writing about during this long walk. So I think if you have a context for the students to understand why this is an important story for students to learn, not because we want to be victims or not because we're trying to um, create any kind of conflict, but because like Evangeline said, it's the truth. This is a truth. This is a story being told from the viewpoint uh, of someone from the inside who knows these stories. And, you know, I just think that because we love stories, you know, it's good to share these stories because we learn from them in so many ways. And we are able to learn about other people's other times and understand our humanity and understand each other. And I think that's what is important about any story is you can always learn from them. I totally agree. Um, this idea of context, um, what we talk about in literature being own voices reaching out to authors and presenters who are from the culture, who speak the language of whichever topic you're trying to teach is a huge thing. Um, we publish, uh, Solana Bookshelf publishes Navajo and Hopi books written by Navajo and Hopi writers, illustrated by Navajo and Hopi authors. And I would also encourage you all to visit Lower Tohi's website, lowertohi.com. I'll go ahead and put it in the chat. And Laura, of course, I know you've been working for years writing your own um, writing your own books about the co-talkers and uh, boarding schools as well. Um, again, this idea of own voices. Laura Tohi is Navajo. She is a great storyteller um, and a and rare, very important historian too. So again, this idea of context the context being told from someone of that culture. Um, always important thing when you're trying to teach. I think that is it. If if I think that's if that's all for questions, um, thank you everyone for coming out. And if you have any last few words, um, go ahead and feel free to say anything, Laura. And thank you again. Yeah, you know, and you were mentioning how you learned from Evangeline and the same thing happened for me too, because sometimes I would be writing a poem or an essay or something and I would come across a word or lack of a word. And I used to call up Vangeline and she never said, no, I'm too busy for you. Can you call me back later? She never said that. She was always, okay. Um, she would stop and She'd say, what about this word or this expression? You know, we'd discuss it. And then sometimes I wouldn't really know, I wasn't really aware of a word that she was using. So she would teach me uh, what this word meant. And then she would give me these little language lessons, <laughs> which I really appreciated because um, it was something I didn't know. And that's one of the things I will miss about her, not only that she was a wonderful friend, but she was so knowledgeable about the language and um, the teachings in these words and in the teachings in our language. And she was always there to help me um, with that. And I so appreciated that. So now I have to find someone new to, <laughs> or someone else to help me with the language. But yeah, so I learned a lot from Vanjie. In fact, the, the novels that she wrote uh, I went as I was reading them. I kept a notebook of all the words that I really wasn't that familiar with that I didn't learn when I was growing up, and um, I learned what their their meanings were, and then I would look them up in the dictionary. So I have a little notebook uh, that I kept and uh, that I was using to learn new Navajo words. 
Right, thank you again, Laura, for your kind words and for reading and joining us here tonight. Um, another question, what is going to happen to Dr. Parsons Yazzie's unfinished work? Um, I'm not really sure. That could be something that we look into a bit further. Um, I was familiar that she was writing a book as well. Um, um, so, you know, she was a wonderful storyteller. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, but thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you, Laura, again, for your wonderful words, for sharing your experiences with us and for reading this wonderful book. Um, again, go ahead and visit solanabookshelf.com if you want to purchase uh, Little Woman Warrior. And do please visit lauratohi.com as well to see all the work and learn a little bit more about our reader tonight, Laura Tohi, as well. Um, one of the most important influential Navajo writers um, um, that's ever existed. So thank you again, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, thank you yeah. again for asking me to do this. And it was my honor to honor my friend in this small way for her work. Mm. So I yeah. can't. Right. Okay. And to everyone, you for coming. Thanks again, everyone, for coming. Again, uh, this webinar is recorded. Expect either a few days for it to show up on YouTube. Go ahead and follow us at Solana Bookshelf, or if you go, want to go ahead and visit our website sometime early next week, we'll have this recorded and um, put up on the website too. So thanks everyone again. Thank you, Laura. Um, everyone have a good night. Stay warm. Yeah, travel safe. Thank you. Good night. Good night.